thank you, patient listeners of Graphic Policy Radio Podcast. The following episode was recorded in September. I've been super busy with the elections and didn't have the bandwidth to do this episode justice till now. And it's a topic I'm really excited to cover. Some of my favorite Daredevil comics of all time. This episode needed a special introduction to one, explain the very September nature of the following conversation. And two, because the news has been such a moving target. I mean, a week ago, my friends were dancing in the streets of Philadelphia with Gritty, right? But what I want you to know, no matter when you listen to this, is that it's okay to feel good about what we've achieved. And it's also okay to feel scared about what we have to fight for moving forward. We need the feelings to survive, and we also need solidarity to survive what comes next. So join an organization that has a local chapter. It could be the Sunrise Movement, Democratic Socialists of America, Working Families Party, a mutual aid organization whose name I haven't even heard where you live. No one expects you to do everything, but everyone can do something, even if it's just online. Online is real. I mean, you're listening to me, right? This is online, too. And if you want to connect with me about joining something and need some suggestions, or maybe you just have some Daredevil comics feelings, you know how to reach me, Ilana underscore Brooklyn on Twitter. That's E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn on Twitter. So give yourself space to have the feelings you have, because to quote the late, great macho man Randy Savage, emotions high, emotions low, emotions in between. Thank you, listener friends. Welcome to Graphic Policy Radio, where comics and politics meet. I'm your host, Elon Levin. This is the comics podcast for people who were in no way surprised when Kingpin became mayor of New York City in the comics, but still really want to know who won the comptroller's race. They never reported on that from the 616, and it's a pretty important role. Tonight, we're going to be talking about an old comic that's a bit of an unsung classic. It's the original Daredevil Inferno storyline from way back in the year 1989. It's written by Anne Nocenti, penciled by John Romita Jr., lettered by Joe Rosen, inked by Al Williamson, and colorist Christy Christy Sheila. Um, And we'll also be discussing the current Daredevil series Inferno storyline, drawing some comparisons and talking about the way this very New York comic talks about two very different points in New York's history and how it changes over time and all of that good stuff. And joining me, I've got two really exciting guests, one of whom is returning guest. Leslie Lee of The Third is one of the hosts of Struggle Sessions, a popular podcast you may or may need to listen to if you have not listened to it yet. Welcome back to the show, Leslie. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. It's always great talking with you about comics and like just really being a massive nerd. So (laughs) thank you. Thank you. And joining me for the first time on the show is Scott Thoreau. Scott is a Brooklyn-born, Baltimore-based producer-composer, INFP, Scorpio, and musician. He is also co-host of Zebras in America with Marcus Pinn from Pinland Empire. And um, that's actually how I know him. I know him through his podcast as well. Uh, And I've been on his podcast, so now we are finally trading... I don't, I've also been on Leslie's podcast. It's just like a big podcast guest reunion. Yeah, this mutual is, aid podcast party. Yeah. Exactly. Like, it's, it's 2020. We, we've all been on each other's podcasts. Yeah. Thank you. It's so good to be here. I'm excited. Comic books are great. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, you can give you a chance to talk about them instead of the usual film stuff. But, um, yeah. you know, I... I I wanted to just sort of jump in with this series. I, I began reading it, uh, I don't even know, but it was sort of inspired by an offhanded comment that uh, Jay Edidin made during um, the uh, Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men podcast coverage of Inferno. There, there was an aside, she was like, oh yeah, and then there's that time that Daredevil got beat up by a vacuum cleaner. And I had yeah. this moment of like, Really? And then I went and I was like, oh, no, he very much did. <laughs> and I noticed I, I had actually read a chunk of these comics before, but I had not read that issue. And I, for whatever reason, my my I, I read some of Daredevil and Ocenti JRJR before, and it had always been very discontinuous. And now through the magic of the Internet, I'm like, I can just read this whole thing in order properly. And so I began doing it and it really solidified in my mind, like, 
that this is just an amazing run of Daredevil and that people should be talking more about it. And and as I was reading Inferno, which is a very New York based story, I was like, I have so much to say on this. You know, folks might probably know I live in New York. I've lived in New York City for the past 20 years. And I went to college in New York State before that. And my Twitter handle is Ilana Brooklyn. And I've worked in New York politics. And I worked in Hell's Kitchen and all that. And I was like, I this is a comic that has a lot going on with New York City and a lot to say on it. And when we had originally talked about doing this episode together, it was like back in the very, very beginning of COVID uh, hitting America. And now it feels even more timely than ever before, because for folks who don't know, uh, Inferno is where devils and demons take over New York City. Um, And uh, there's just this constant stream of people talking in the comic about what's happening to New York. Oh, my God, New York's being destroyed or this or that. And I just was like, there's so much I have to say about this. So I want to thank you for humoring me as I jump into this uh, this moment. And, and I'd love to hear from each of you, like Scott, did you did you read Daredevil as a as a as a kid when you were like growing up in New York? Was that one of your comics? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, Carroll Gardens. I went to junior high school in Hell's Kitchen at professional performing arts school. I was in a gospel choir with Alicia Keys. I I liked Daredevil <laughs> growing up just because I was like, oh, his whole superpower is that he's a tough kid from Hell's Kitchen. And growing up in the 90s, Hell's Kitchen was a tough ass neighborhood. People, you know, 42nd Street was not what it is now. Well, I heard it's getting rough there again, but it was just a very different place. And I ah. liked I like characters that are flawed and hurt and upset. And I like how Daredevil was just like kind of a sad dude, but was trying to do the right thing. And unlike other superhero characters from the city who have lots of access and resource, he doesn't. And he's just trying to help people. And so I always thought it was tight. I read this run in high school when I was just eating up everything. Frank Miller, because I thought he was really tight when I was younger. Nowadays, I have less, I have more nuanced views about him. And this run was, you know, Mm -hmm. sort of like, oh, this is kind of the sleeper New York City Daredevil run. And I remember liking it. And I just reread it, obviously, for the podcast uh, two times. I I reread the the run twice since we started talking about it. And it's very, it's very of its time and it's very of this time. And that's what I like about the duality nature of it. Yeah, yeah. And Leslie, what's your history reading Daredevil? So uh, my history is not reading Daredevil, actually. I'm not much uh, of a Daredevil fan. I prefer, you know, uh, Batman if I'm going to go with a street-level guy. If I'm going with a street-level superhero in Marvel, it's probably going to be Punisher, uh, not Daredevil. It's just the thing about Daredevil that always kind of irked me is, like, someone just needs to tell Matt Murdock that like being catholic is not a substitute for a personality like <laughs> Damn. I, it's it's so hard to know what this guy actually wants what he's actually about because he always and no matter what he's talking about no matter what internal dialogue he has it always redounds to like these one like his you know respect for you know the catholic church respect for the status quo and just for me as a street level you know, superheroes like you're not you're you you're you should be the number one guy wanting to smash all this stuff down. Like when Rhino is like trying to uh destroy the cathedral and the new version of Inferno, I'm like, Oh Matt, you should be helping him take it down because he's trying to help you through whatever trauma that you still are going <laughs> through. Like this would be a very good thing for you to help Rhino do that but I, um but i've never been a big daredevil fan but these comics are pretty good so i, I i'm happy uh, to read these and in fact i think i'll go back and finally read these say uh, some of the frank miller uh daredevil stuff that i never go around to well it's interesting because for me like i sort of was an accidental daredevil fan and, and in the sense that i really love reading daredevil comics and i'm incredibly critical of him and the, you know this whole lead up of 
I feel like one of the things that I love about Anna Senti's take on Daredevil is that she realizes his bullshit and yeah. is just going to like call him on it time after time. And Daredevil is officially the worst boyfriend in the Marvel universe. <laughs> like, not even a question. You know, I've had debates with the, you know, the T. Fogner was like, no, no, it's, 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 it's a uh, Steve Rogers. I'm like, no, it is definitely Daredevil. And it is in, it is in her run that we see like literally a sequence in which, um, where Daredevil is cheating on Karen Page with Typhoid Mary. Yeah. And he's making out with Typhoid Mary while a blind child burns himself on a hot stove in his apartment. Like, and unsupervised. He's like leaving a he's leaving a blind child unsupervised in his apartment to burn himself while he makes out with his girlfriend while he's cheating on his girlfriend. Right. It's like you are a complete piece of shit. And I'm actually okay with like, you know, he suffers. And I'm like, yeah, you did this to yourself. So wh- I mean, why do I love I love Daredevil anyway? Because it's so rooted in New York City. A- and the ways in which he's terrible are so realistic. Like he is just like a very realistic shitty ex. Like, I'm like, I know. All of these things, especially the Catholic pieces. I'm like, yes, no, I, I'm so glad I don't, I'm so glad I'm not married to you. And um, this is all very interesting. So, and then with this particular series, we're gifted with this amazing, you know, JRJR art, which is so essential to, to like, just how noteworthy it feels with the character designs and all that. Yeah, it was very nostalgic for me because I remember reading a lot of JRJR when he did Punisher, when he did... The mm. comic where it was Ghost Rider, Dare, uh, it was Ghost Rider, Wolverine, and uh, maybe Punisher, um, where like Black, uh, where the son of um, Mephisto, is it Blackthorn, shows up, and the way his design for him is, and is the same design they use kind of for all the demons, like those, mm-hmm. like you know, lot those like heavy lines uh, going uh, through them. The same way he does like hair and dreads and stuff. Like mm-hmm. I always, I really, really um, like uh, his art style. He was my favorite uh, artist uh, growing up. Oh, cool! Yeah, there's something about the texture that he draws where there's a lot of long, narrow like lines that sort of break off into shapes. It's like. They're like sticks. It looks like there's sticks inside of everything. Yeah. Like, gra- I don't know. It's hard to describe. And also he but it's did really like, recognizable. And he did the strangest looking Superman and also kick ass and stuff. When he went over <laughs> to Superman, I was like, that's an interesting take. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I feel like the way he's drawing demons and monsters and especially machinery in during inferno like the closest there is to anything would be um bill sinkevich like i think that the uh the um the vacuum cleaner that we see beating up daredevil like is a little bit of a sinkevich warlock feel to it yeah absolutely absolutely oh totally yeah and and the funny thing about the whole like daredevil getting beat up by a vacuum cleaner thing is that when you hear about Daredevil get, almost getting killed by a vacuum cleaner, you're like, wow, that sounds pretty farcical. But the whole series builds up to a point where you're like, yeah, he's doing so badly. I believe that a demonically possessed vacuum cleaner could definitely almost kill him. Like that's, <laughs> you have made that, you've made that a plausible case. Um, I, I love the artwork that JR has for the sequence immediately like where you see the vacuum cleaner slowly approaching and it's like a vacuum is just a tool. It shouldn't be able to hurt anybody. Right. And it has, a, it's like, for, you know, North by Northwest. I mean, okay. You guys know North by Northwest, like the whole, like we're walking through a field. Oh, there's this little district concerning thing out of the corner of my eyes. Oh my God. It's right here. And like the fear of this crop duster plane, that's like suddenly right up in your vision. That whole sequence was just like very North by Northwest to me. Do you guys have any favorite visual moments? I really liked um, Kingpin's war on Christmas and like as the lead up to because like this the story goes from Christmas to Christmas. Right. And like Kingpin is just shirtless playing tennis, being like, I hate Christmas. And all I really want (laughs) is is like posters of Kingpin shirtless playing tennis, being like the most maddest kingpin i've i've reread because usually he's more warm and cal- smart and calculated where this one mm-hmm. is just like 
I'm really mad. I hate Matt Murdock. Matt Murdock is the worst. I don't like Matt Murdock. I always just want to play tennis and be angry. And so for me, <laughs> for me, angry Kingpin the whole time was just really doing it for me. And and obviously the the illustration style of Typhoid Mary when she's Typhoid Mary just like gives me the best of 80s Marvel vibes. Like and one of my favorite characters, Longshot, who is mm-hmm. who is basically created by Innocenti as well. So that's that that aesthetic is my aesthetic is is the kids say that's embarrassing i have to go bye <laughs> no it's fine and i hear you what yeah, about you leslie i really yeah i, I was going to say ty for mary too i really love her design it's so cool it's not necessarily like a superhero costume it's something that a regular person could wear uh to like a club or something it's yeah, also something yeah. like a professional wrestler uh might wear it's like <laughs> it's just like really cool and it's very 80s but like it would still be cool and in style now i think if yeah. somebody showed up in that mm-hmm. definitely no her outfit is great her outfit really is great i love her her look and you know he's like going out for saturday night in the lower east side yeah exactly and like there's so much just like new york city like all all throughout this one and you know one one of the the sort of constant like things that you hear throughout the particularly the inferno piece of daredevil are people talking about like oh my god there's just one guy who spends an entire issue of the comic saying i hate new york i hate new york there's like people talking about oh new york is becoming the inferno you know they're dealing with the middle of a heat wave and you know the the context and and you have you know new york city getting possessed by demons and you know inferno began in x-men like this is basically an x-men crossover and then nusenti was edit was an editor on X Men when she yeah. was writing this Daredevil book. So this whole thing kind of this was a this was a crossover that was a consensual crossover that happened rather than a um, a non consensual crossover. And um, but like the whole idea that like you're having this New York that's taken over by demons is so like okay I see what you're trying to say here. You know people like working and making comics in 1989 in New York City. Like I. This the, the 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 political subtext is text, and um, you're you know like saying a lot of stuff here, and and what was so what was so crazy for me was like reading all these people talking about New York being this complete hellscape, living in New York, and like actually COVID is like the hellscape, and it was not, and then like you know like literally there's like people in. There's like old white people in like the middle of nowhere in Iowa who think that New York City and other cities are like literally on fire right now, which is just not true. I mean, things are on fire on the West Coast on the count of like literally like climate change. Like that's a separate thing. I'm talking about like they think that people have literally burned down all of the cities, which is not true. And so it's 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 sort of this like I could like I was like hearing these voices of people like being like New York is destroyed and me being in New York being like yeah, not like you're thinking it is actually. And I don't feel like I'm on hell on earth, actually. Like that's a different thing that you're pointing towards. It was this weird, like, it just was this very weird, like I, there were so many panels that I wanted to just sort of post to Twitter of like people like talking about hell. And then I was realizing through the lens of the conversations that were happening around New York that me posting them would come off like I was actually saying this was an accurate (laughs) representation of what life was like in New York right now. And like, I've been in Manhattan since COVID, like shit's not on fire. Like, I mean, I, I, you know, like the crisis is very different. Like everybody is going to be getting kicked out of their apartments because they didn't get rent relief. But this isn't like, it isn't like, physically on fire and like nobody's just like getting shot at walking on the fucking street like there's this very sensationalized due to racism like and political agenda like thing coming in from outside of the city and for me like you know i didn't move to new york until 1997 so i didn't live in new york during the crack epidemic and during like the really bleak shit but it felt like so much of like, okay, like you guys are all saying New York is hell, but like, it's it's not hell. It's really not. I understand why you might have felt that way, but I swear to you, it's not. I don't know. Scott, you lived there. <laughs> did, did, did this New York, as depicted in Daredevil in hell, uh, feel recognizable to you in any way? Well, it's 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 like a duality, right? Like, 
you you remember that movie 80 blocks from Tiffany's so like as yes as so like good. gangs are taking over the Bronx people are still rich and going to stores on Fifth Avenue so the mm-hmm. even when I was going to school on 48th Street some blocks were Broadway and some blocks you could like smoke PCP with your friend's cousin and go see a Foo Fighters concert like there's there are a lot of things mm-hmm. going on. The whole like thing about like New York on fire is that while Anne Nocenti is not a subtle writer, a lot of the fire that goes on in the cities is 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 subtle. It's not actual burning. It's it's what mm-hmm. we're talking about, like food inequity and people not being able to pay rent. And but no, nothing is literally on fire in New York City. And aside from the occasional arson, it was just like it was just a different place and. It's compl- it's complicated. Like it was very unsafe for some people and it was very safe for other people. That's like the genius of capitalism. If you have mm-hmm. a lot of money, you're probably all right. <laughs> and if you don't, it's it's not because I know even me who is like middle of the line, I knew kids growing up that never knew that New York City was a tough place. And then I grew up with kids that never knew that New York City wasn't. So mm-hmm. that that's my that's my two cents about it. And what I like is that she begins a lot of this with talking about the hell in very like literal, realistic political terms. Like there's like I, I, it's unclear because of the way the, the the panels are drawn, which of these it's either it's either Black Widow or Karen Page saying this, but uh, saying the poor get forced out of their homes. The place is ripe for revolution. Sooner we yeah. get and you're like, yeah. It's right for evolution. And then the reply is, the sooner we get to the police station, the better. <laughs> womp, yeah. womp, womp. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm also like confused about people getting on the train to go to a police station because there's police stations like every fucking eight feet and they're like out there without any masks on. But um, but like I, it was such an inter- but like but the but the fact that the initial like the hell and the stress is coming from, yeah, like you said, realistic things. And then I guess for folks who don't know the Inferno, the Inferno story, like literally like you have elevators that bite people's hands off and vending machines. It's a lot of it is machinery that becomes demonically possessed, injuring people. But you also have people becoming demo- demonically possessed and injuring people too. I mean, the real bad guy, and that's what I love, the real bad guy, big bad, other than uh, Typhoid Mary and Kingpin, I guess he's not the big bad, the dragon, so to speak. Actually, there's two dragons. Mm. One of the two dragons that Daredevil has to fight in Cap- Inferno capitalism as well. is... Uh, I'm sorry. Capitalism is also one of the big bad dragons. Yeah, exactly. He, and sorry. he's fighting like <laughs> he's fighting the uh, a dentist. No, no, no. He's fighting a dentist who also starts wearing a cop uniform. And I'm like, yes, Daredevil. That's I. I don't share your hatred of dentists, but I. Although there are some <laughs> sketchy ones, but yeah. yes, like def, def, definitely go beat up that guy in the cop outfit. Like you have <laughs> these cops just sitting there being like, I don't give a fuck what's happening. And so, like, a lot of the big knockdown drag out fight scenes in one of the issues of Inferno was, like, Daredevil versus a person who appears to be a cop with large, monstrous teeth. Mm-hmm. And also, something that's noticeable is at the beginning of this, at the beginning of the run, the cops are like, we love Daredevil. He, he like, you know, where, where sometimes in comic books, the, the heroes aren't cool with the cops. The cops are like, yeah, Daredevil, mm-hmm. he's the good guy helping us fight the bad people. You know, and then and then they become demon people reading this sort of, I guess I would say, like incredibly like 1989 comic moment. Do you feel like it still feels current in some ways or? Well, here, well, here's the thing. Like, I think we talked about this when you came on Struggle Session, the X-Men um, Days of Future Past and mm-hmm. God Loves Man Kills. <clears throat> They both had the element of like New York City as hell. Both those comic books have like brawl, uh, like a just you know roving gangs of you know violent rapist youth, multicultural youth, and both of those <laughs> uh, things. And this kind of has that same feel where you know I, I didn't go to go to New York until like you know the two thousands or something, so I didn't see this version of New York except in but it was in person but I saw it in movies and TV mm-hmm. shows all the time and now that's and that I've no we talked about on struggle session a lot about like how that 
history of New York has mostly been erased and forgotten. So this is a bit of a time capsule where people are talking about how much they hate New York. How it's like a like the first like panel first page is like New York is like a battleground, a war zone, and it's only peaceful because it's like a ceasefire. Now it's like that's just like not what people think of New York uh, right now at all. Yeah. Except for aside from you know the people who watch Fox News a lot. Yeah, exactly. It's this weird thing. It's like on the one hand, like you know, we were hearing. Um, like sirens constantly of people getting taken to the hospitals, like constantly, you know, like the way COVID came in New York was like, not like what the experiences that people in other cities had, like people, people died at home from unrelated things because they were scared to go to the hospitals because the hospitals had COVID like, like, and like, you know, I, I, we, we all know like people who died and it's like, it's, but it, but like people came together and, and that's the thing that, you know, it, there's a lot more of the people coming together thing in the 2020 Inferno story than in the original one. Um, but I felt like, and I was really glad to see it in 2021, but I felt like, yeah, like people are like literally dying. And back in March, like you thought if you walked past someone on the street and they didn't have a mask on, you could die. Um, but it still was like there were people like starting mutual aid networks and doing emergency response work and like mobilizing huge amounts of food to get to people. And like there was just tons of stuff that was happening that the community was coming together to address, even though, you know, the elected political leaders were just complete pieces of shit. Um, and so you, you know, you just it doesn't have it doesn't have the same like mis misanthropy, I guess, that you kind of are left with without it. I mean, you do have at the very end of this Inferno, you do see New of, of the uh, 89 Inferno, you do see New Yorkers cleaning up garbage. But in the uh, Ship Zdarsky and gosh, shit, who did the art on this issue? Um, in the Ship Zdarsky written and oh, it is Ch Chichetto back on this one. Um, you know, you actually don't just see people cleaning up garbage. You see people like taking up the Daredevil helmet yeah. and like, fighting back. Yeah. So is it time to kind of get into the new issue the new version of inferno and how they portrayed the police in 2020 um i know these you know these storylines are planned ahead of time but wow i i can't imagine like like a worse time to do a story about how the cops stop enforcing the law and then uh Hell's Kitchen becomes a war zone and people yeah. are begging for the, the the NYPD to come back and the noble NYPD, you know, go out there and be damn cops and save, nobly save everyone. Like that, that's just, it's not the vibe right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not the best time. For the most part. I, 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 I just... Yeah, and you could do that. I mean, I'm sure those stories happen all the time. I, the baseline, mm -hmm. certainly, of Marvel Comics is that the NYPD are about the most noble people in the world, aside from whoever needs to be, like, the cricket cop of the week for whatever that comic is. But that is, like, an undercurrent. Certainly, you see it with Spider-Man. God, you see it so much in the Spider-Man video game. Like, Jesus Christ. Oh, because I don't feel like that's true in general. Like, I think that, like, there's a lot of i mean it's 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 not it's very rarely addressed as a systemic problem it's usually yeah. like oh here's these corrupt cops or here's these these bad cops but i don't feel like there's a lot of cops that you actually are supposed to like well i i don't i'm not i'm more of a dc person than a marvel person it just seems like every time i'm reading marvel i'm reading about the heroic the heroics of the nypd more it's certainly in the spider-man game yeah uh, that there's mm. just tons of it in there, uh, unfortunately. But, um, like, you could have the same story and be like, oh, yes, the cops are part of the problem. It's not just right. – because yeah. the, the comic is really interesting because it tries to tell Daredevil, okay, just going around beating up these random criminals isn't enough. At least I think that was a storyline before this yes, is what happened, and uh, that's what I picked up. So he goes after, you know, the, the two richest people in the world. I don't know how they why they had to be the two richest people in the world, why they couldn't just be billionaires but whatever but you know the two richest people in the world he goes after them um with i guess uh electra steals a couple billion uh from him 
and then he redistributes it through, uh, throughout Hill's Kitchen and seemingly changes nothing for anyone in any significant uh, matter. Like dropping a billion dollars, I would think, would change a lot, a lot of things for a lot of people. But everybody's just right. kind of like going about their business and showing up uh, to work. And the biggest problem that they have is that the cops aren't around because the billionaires got mad and told the cops not to patrol the city anymore. Which, as we all know, the NYPD has done not just to Hell's Kitchen, mm-hmm. but to the entire city, and nothing bad happened. In fact, uh, yeah. things, uh, from what I understand, things were better. Yeah, yeah. The cops are, the cops have like a work stoppage. It's right. been hilarious. Whenever the NYPD is like, we're not going to arrest people, it, it actually makes life for a lot of people better. Because they're not really, they're mostly dealing with quality of life crimes anyway, and quality of life that those aren't crimes. And a, a good point that you just came mm-hmm. up with, Leslie, is that in in the Marvel universe, like cops are like pretty awesome. Where in the DC universe, like Gotham Central, the main conceit is that like there's like five good cops. Yeah, <laughs> and that's still too many for my taste, but still, you know. Right, I feel like mm-hmm. Gotham Central would be a difficult thing to to do again now but it's just i've always thought that that was an interesting duality well they're that, trying to do a tv show about it that, yeah yeah i read about that we'll see i i think that that would be a that would be a spicy topic right now but see i don't think that the new inferno frames the cops as it, it frames this one individual cop as being a good guy detective cole north there's a mm-hmm. lot of people in marvel whose last name is north and i have to wonder if any of them are related but whatever um, he Probably. and uh, he's like the good guy cop, and then the other cops are just like when when the when the richest people in the world tell them to stop enforcing the law in Hell's Kitchen, the other cops are just sort of like, all right, and like they don't they seem antagonistic with Daredevil, like in a competitive sort of way, and they're not really good at their jobs, and there's a gang war going on, just generally speaking, and of course Daredevil is like sleeping with somebody's wife because it's Daredevil, um, but like. I, I don't think that, like, I think North is like, you know, he's like the one good cop, like, is a super valorized, ridiculous character. But I feel like there's a lot of cops in this that are not. I mean, for one thing, if the cops were, if the cops were, quote unquote, good guys, even the stro- even the rich people telling them to stop patrolling New York wouldn't keep them from patrolling New York. Like, they would right. be like, well, fuck you, we're going to do it anyway. I don't know. I guess, um, I, guess I, I guess my yeah. thing is, like, the version of this comic that makes so much more sense is one where Daredevil realizes that the cops are a part of the system too. It's like he only realizes mm-hmm. that rich people are are like the problem after 50 years of fighting Kingpin. <laughs> like, wow, he yeah. finally has his revelation that rich people are part of the systemic problem. Like, maybe there are some other things going on too. And it really just, I mean, because what cops are are like the you know the 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 enforcers of capitalism you know it's like they mm-hmm. do take orders from rich people but except the order that they give in this is to not police hell's kitchen when in fact what they would do when they want to you know take over a neighborhood and gentrify it gentrify it they say do more policing that is a real mm-hmm. thing that happens yep. in the real world and, and i've actually seen it in fictional things too so I, I, it was kind of surprising to see uh in this modern comic after black lives matter while black lives matter is going on to get mm-hmm. it like re- wrong and and make it in reverse it's like no there should be cops constantly uh cracking skulls on the streets in order to um throw people out their homes and stuff like that and just make it hell for the people living there so that people can so that the uh rich people uh can gentrify it that that's what really happened yeah. so i i don't know why they went in the other yeah it's not a comic book comment. that's like it would have been reality. so easy to do it too like you said it would have been so easy to tell the story and then you mm-hmm. have daredevil having to be possibly in physical conflict uh with the police and you know that's kind of why i always you know even though Batman, of course, of course, you know, may be a fascist, but he's a fascist who fights cops a lot, you know, so I can at least appreciate <laughs> him for that. Well, I will say that um, I there I liked in, I, I Well, one, just in general, folks, in case you were wondering, like, should I read the Concurrent and Daredevil series or not? I've really enjoyed it a lot. I actually think it's really um, great. I actually think it's a really yeah. great comic. There were just some 
what I would consider it is quite good thematic missteps, but it's a, sure. but it is a very very good comic. I think yeah, it's really one of the things I have to hand it to uh, Mark to Ch- uh, Mark Ch- Chetto to doing is he managed to make Stiltman fucking terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to have nightmares when Stiltman about Stiltman. Hey, I'm walking here. <laughs> oh, God, it's terrifying. How did he do that? Congratulations. Um, he also does Daredevil's hair really well um, and, like, seems to understand how that hair works, um, which is cool because, like, yeah, I, you know, like, the, like the ha- hair in JRJR's world, like, doesn't work like hair in our world, but it looks really fucking cool. And then hair in Tchekos' world does work like hair in our world, and it also looks really cool. Both of these things are legitimate approaches to drawing hair. Um, uh, actually, I do want to say uh, the other dragon that we see uh, Daredevil fighting in OG flavor Inferno is the F train. And there's this amazing panel of him like putting a spear like through this, like, F train that's become a dragon. And on, I was only yeah. when I just reread it again that I had this moment of being, oh, that's St. George versus the dragon. And like that layer of like Catholic imagery just finally clicked in that battle. But as a New Yorker, like if there was a train that was the devil, it the F train is like, could definitely be it. But it feels like it would probably be the G. Yeah, the G I was about to say, I've heard or the R train. The There's a lot of bad trains. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But the but like but like the whole idea that like one of the tr- subway trains turns into like a dragon demon you have to fight is like perfect like nailed yes. it great fucking concept. If if I may in every way yeah if I may say a couple things uh, that that was what I was saying was like with with Nascenti she's just like not being like her 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 and and Ramita are just like this is what it is we're this is not about metaphor this is like it and i like that and also i one of my favorite scenes that's like very childish that i find it's really cool is the episode where where johnny storm lights a cigarette with his head because yes. i just like that's just like so beautifully 80s like and like such a trick that he would have no. like let me light let me light your cigarette mm-hmm. with my head man and um y'all know the comic book writer christopher priest oh yes yes chris priest we love him. In fact, Leslie and I talked about him on the show. Yeah. We did a whole episode with uh, his Okay, I'm going to have yeah. to go back and do that. Do y'all ever heard his record ho- streetwise when he under the pseudonym Hollis Stone? Oh, no. So he ha- he like made music in the 80s that really sounds like what people in the OG Inferno would be listening to. And I highly Ooh. suggest y'all rare record nerds to go look for Streetwise Hollow Stone. Um, that's just my my little two cents about the 80s. Yeah, I'm listening 80s. to wow. it now. It's very, very funk. Very funk. Oh, yeah. Wow. Is there anything he can't do? <laughs> that's wild. I've been very impressed. Um, very but this is a Chris Priest fan podcast, yes. certainly, to say. To say. Um, I love that. I love the Johnny Storm issue so much. Thank you for bringing it up because Johnny Storm is this fucking enormous cornball yeah. in this, and like he's just being so ridiculous. And he wears a T-shirt that says "bad" on it, like, and he basically shows up at Rudy's bar and tr- gets Rudy's bar set on fire. And I like, if it wasn't COVID, I want to like go to Rudy's bar and, and house kitchen and be like, guys, do you know that Johnny storm <laughs> fucking showed up trying to act tough and accidentally sent your bar on fire. Cause like that, that, that I'm pretty sure that's Rudy's. Um, and that fucking corny motherfucker just like, he's trying to sort of wake, he's trying to like wave his dick around to like take, cause daredevil's missing. So he's trying to wave his dick around to like, be like, okay guys, listen to me. And he's doing it at the request of, Karen Page, but like his whole way approach of doing it is so ridiculousness. Um, but it's so campy. And yeah. and I love the and deliberate. Like Anne is a hundred percent like, this isn't me telling you it's campy. Like Anne is telling you this is campy. This is ridiculous. Johnny Storm is not capable of doing this. But it is, it is, it is, it is great. It is a great fun. It is like the whole issue is really, is really fun. Um Yeah, I like how because I also I'm not the biggest fan of Fantastic Four, so I like when they show up in another comic and people treat them like like fucking like 
I don't know, like a boy band or something like that. Like mm-hmm. you're not a real like tough superhero. You're just you're just like one of the famous ones that everybody loves. They're good featured artists. Um, the Fantastic Four when yeah. they show up, they're like, <laughs> "Oh, verse yeah. this verse by Johnny Storm." And I also read that Anne Nocenti did that because she wanted to do uh, an issue where Daredevil didn't fight at all. She wanted to do a com a, like a bunch of issues mm-hmm. where there there wasn't fighting. And she was told that couldn't happen. So she was like, all right, I'm just going to have Johnny Storm be a dick. And that, that made me happy. <laughs> and, and so she did. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Johnny Storm is a character that has a lot of potential that, um, you know, I, and I mean, there's a lot of fans who have made good cases for like him having like, you know, bisexual subtext, etc. And I just like, I just really love the fucking outfit he shows up in. And expects people to take him seriously as a tough guy. <laughs> it's it's adorable. Never change. Um, uh, you know, Karen Page has got like a lot going on in this series, and this is you know this takes place after the point in the story where she has a history of having had a drug addiction and having done sex work, and like you know you see her interacting at the police station with like working girls who are like, hey, what's up, and. She's like, doesn't want to talk with them and is like, I don't want to deal with you. And they're like, what? You're too fucking cool for us now. And I was like, I feel like it's unclear whose side you're supposed to take in that, but it's clear to me who's oh, side I they definitely take in that. Sex workers side. Fuck Karen. I know. Page. Definitely, yeah. I know, but like, I feel like they kind of maybe want us to not. I, I, but I'm like, no, Karen. Like, please don't be a dick. Like, you worked with these women. They're still putting in the work. Like, don't be like that. Um. I mean, and but like, you know, but and Karen is weird because like she has these moments of totally getting it and then these moments of not getting it. And I still have sympathy for her just because like she, you know, she's dealt with a lot. But um, but she literally is like she also says like, uh, you know, that. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost the quote. She says, like the, she says, like, oh, yeah, the cops closed the clinic that they put together. So it's like, yes, you're this close to realizing the problem. What do you guys think about the little kids that are all over the Nusenti Daredevil stuff? The, 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 the two little kids. It was it, it was it kind of made me feel like I was just missing something because these characters would just show up. And I was like, when were they introduced? What's their purpose here? But it just felt like, OK, this is a ongoing comic from the era where you actually just had ongoing comics instead of it was a six part mm-hmm. series a six part series six part series and it just felt like oh these are just other characters in the daredevil comic that show up and have little adventures of their own or give comments or daredevil meets up with every so often i i, I just thought it was i didn't think much of it uh, aside from the fact that it made the world seem a little bit richer than mm-hmm. what you would see in most comic books, modern comics nowadays. You just don't have those side characters as much. And side characters make those comics. I love the little side characters that, that really add texture and flavor to a world. Like, yeah, who have like, no yeah. powers. Much to uh, Matt Murdock's chagrin. He's like trying to fucking um, do like a, what's the, the drummer movie? Um, the with the the drum teacher played by the guy who plays J. Jonah Jameson. Whiplash, Whiplash, yeah. uh, Whiplash. whiplash. Yeah, like, I, he's trying to I like Whiplash this <laughs> this blind kid into becoming yeah. Daredevil. And he keeps failing at it because the kid was is just you know regularly um you know has just regular you know eyesight problems. He did, wasn't hit with like toxic waste, so he doesn't yeah. Yeah. radioactive yeah, he, isotope. Yeah, he doesn't have echolocation, <laughs> uh, Matt, so uh, take it easy. Yeah. Can we point out that like Matt Murdock is like forcing trauma bonding onto this young kid like to where yeah. like where he could like break the chain? Like I think of like Matt Murdock who's like obviously his his power really is Catholic guilt as mm-hmm. Stick stick is like his custom motto to to him being like Mike Tyson, where like these dudes are teaching him, uh, him and Mike Tyson, like the wrong, just like, oh, be violent instead of like compassion. I mean, Matt Murdock does have a ton of compassion, but he does not have compassion in trying to turn this kid into, you know, Stockholm Syndrome Daredevil. He's not Stick. And he's kind of, you know, Daredevil is not a very nice person 
as a person in this run. You're like, oh, Matt yeah. Murdock's kind of yep. a jerk. He's definitely a bad boyfriend, and he needs he needs therapy. But yeah, no, that's a really good point. It's super toxic. I, a good point. A good chunk of the uh, Daredevil gets beat up by a vacuum cleaner issue <laughs> is him imagining Stick yelling at him, yeah. in his mind and berating him, and just you're sort of like, wow, this is serious abuse that you went through. I understand why you are considering letting this vacuum cleaner have its way with you. Actually, I should just say also, like, the whole way... So the cover of the vacuum cleaner issue is interesting because when you look at it, it's it looks like Daredevil is wrestling with some sort of machine or, or mechanical entity. You cannot tell it's a vacuum cleaner. And I think that that's, like, crucial to, like, selling the comic in the first place. <laughs> and then when you're in it, you're like, oh, that's a vacuum cleaner. And it doesn't feel like it's a cheat at all. Like the way the coloring and lining is handed, it's like, nope, the, the thing you saw on the cover that you didn't realize was a household implement is in fact that. And like, it, I think it just sort of is like showing you like how do you, how do you draw this one thing, sells it or doesn't sell it. Like there's some panels and then there's some panels in it where like the vacuum cleaner is behind him that looks very much like an insectoid HR Geiger-esque, like, you know, from like the... It's like a technical version of the monsters that are sucking people's brains from um, either from Alien or from like the Naked Lunch, David Lynch movie. And it's sort of like it's insectoid, but it's also kind of sexual. Um, and it just keeps going. There's just a lot. Of, <laughs> there's just a lot of it. Ugh. I, I, and I, I have to give respect for a comic that can like sell something like that to you, right? That sounds so preposterous and silly when you say it, and then actually works in the storytelling. Um, my other, my other favorite little comic nod is basically, which it, one of like the second issue or something of the Inferno crossover. There's literally a scene where Kingpin's assistant basically says, "Kingpin, I regret to inform you that we are in an X Men crossover." <laughs> yes. Yeah, when they, when they say like we're like hell has taken over New York and he's like what the X Men were fighting yeah. he's like the X Men were fighting some people and lost and now hell has <laughs> taken over New York I'm like you just explained to him that he is now in an X Men crossover and that therefore X Men crossover rules apply so <laughs> and I just imagine like I just imagine Fisk being like oh damn it I didn't want to be in an <laughs> X Men crossover can you can you tell them I said no but actually he's just like whatever. I just care about fucking Mary, so I don't care anymore. I'm brain wiped. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of really great Kingpin in, in this. I think Kingpin is such, it's so interesting. Like he really, in the because of the popularity of the TV show, the world at large just regards Kingpin as a Daredevil villain. And I've read more Daredevil than I have Spider-Man. And so I guess I think of Kingpin as a Daredevil villain too, even though he really is a great juxtaposition with like, like literal working class, literal teenager, you know, uh, Peter Parker, like the, you know, the big powerful crime boss versus lawyer for the indigent Daredevil is another really good contrast. Yeah. Um, I, I, I tend to think of Kingpin as a daredevil villain i even remember when he showed up he was in the cartoon the spider-man cartoon from the 90s mm -hmm. so much and being a little disappointed that like daredevil wasn't showing up to be uh just kingpin was like a major uh villain in that i know that there is just something more interesting because there uh kingpin doesn't have powers and daredevil doesn't have any physical powers so it's like a mm -hmm. better like matchup like spider-man has super strength and the webs and he stick through walls obviously he should be too fast for kingpin but um there, there's just something about the way and kingpin I, I it would be a really interesting comic though if kingpin was able to do some of the things he did to daredevil with you know like ex figuring out his identity exposing him getting him fired from his job all, all setting him up for murder like all this shit mm -hmm. that kingpin seemingly can do to daredevil because daredevil is just a guy whereas spider-man oh he's an uh, he's you know he's flying high in the skyscrapers he's has these amazing uh 
uh, powers, but Daredevil is just supposed to be some guy, so like Kingpin can just ruin his real life. Whereas I don't know, I've never, I, I don't know if I've read a Spider Man comic that was quite like that. It could quite capture that because, uh, in part, because Peter Parker is not nearly as pathetic as Matt Murdock, so mm -hmm. I feel like he can never be brought as low as Matt. Which is funny because I feel like Peter probably thinks he is. You know what I mean? Like, I think that Peter views himself as a walking disaster and is often written as someone who thinks of himself that way. And, like, it's sort of, there's often a lot of other characters who are like, no, dude, you're not. Like, we, we all feel like this. We, we, we feel like this. We, we struggle like this. Like, the only person who isn't like this is, like, Tony Stark. And then other characters will be like, no, you're a complete fucking mess. So, like, half the time the characters are, like, sympathetic and are like, no, man, like, I, I get it. It's like this for me, too. And then the other half the time they're like, no, you really are really. Yeah, I, I guess, I, I mean, obviously the original incarnation of Spider-Man was supposed to be bringing the superhero to a more grounded level. But by the time I'm reading him, it's like he's already an adult. He's not a, a high schooler. Mm -hmm. You know, he's established himself as a superhero. So I just see him as any other you know superhero super uh being uh the key word while whereas you know daredevil i all like i i feel like i'm always seeing him get his ass kicked before i even read like an actual yeah. daredevil comic i would just see him get his ass kicked in on the cover in the covers that they would show in wizard like he's always on his knees mm -hmm. he, his costumes always screwed up he's always you know really uh downtrodden but the funny thing is like it doesn't necessarily engender sympathy for him because like some of it a lot of it's his fault and he whines yeah. a lot too even when it's not his fault so i i i, I don't feel as sympathetic you never and uh, what it was consistent in the both the old and the new Inferno. It's like every time Foggy shows up, he's like, "Fuck you, Matt!" Like, like I don't know. Like, I, I yeah. guess something happened before in to but to their relationship uh, before uh, both these series started. But like, Foggy just seems to hate Matt's fucking guts more or less. Yeah, Matt's not a good friend. Um, in a lot of those situations, there's. Uh... A lot of history for justifying why Foggy may respond in those ways. I'm just glad the TV Foggy never got to this moment because I really, really was not a fan of that guy. And if he was like, oh, yeah, I, 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 the show, man, I really couldn't, I couldn't get through the show. I just thought the casting was really all for a lot of it. But yeah, it, it basically has been memory hold. Now there'll be a new Daredevil movie, movie soon, so we don't have to think about it anymore. Gosh, well, I we I did cover I did cover every every season of Daredevil, and uh, folks can hear of the show can certainly catch more of my thoughts on that on the podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that I also really contrasted between the current series and the older series to me is, um, you know, like how each one of them ends the storyline. So the eighty nine Inferno ends with like Daredevil like literally getting a beer at a bar. He's like, okay, he's like all bandaged up, he's bruised, and he's getting a beer at a bar, like a neighborhood bar. Uh, and New Yorkers, you see them sort of cleaning up garbage. There's this like yuppie couple, and this she's saying to her husband and boyfriend, whatever, like, is that a grease chain? And is that a chain stain on your shirt? Because they had been, he'd been possessed with the devil and like was a chains wearing monster. And then she sort of has this look that's sort of like, it looks like you might have been up to something not completely appropriate there. <laughs> um, and uh, he's just sort of like drinking. Uh, and so it has this sort of like moment of reset where the, the people are healing. People are getting back to normal. Daredevil is sort of con he's like the only solution to this is just having a fucking beer because it's been a fucking nightmare. And then the, whereas the end in the current Inferno is Daredevil turning himself into the cops to be held accountable for having accidentally killed someone in um in a in, a, in an arrest or in some in a fight that he'd had which is like a very different way to end on an inferno story yeah uh and before you got to the arrest ending i thought it was pretty cool when everyone in the neighborhood started putting on daredevil masks in fact i felt like that was like a direct callback to the original series where people don't put on the daredevil mask but like the way they treat daredevil devil is just like oh he's just another one of us like he can just mm -hmm. have a 
he can sit at the bar and have a beer. Spider Man can't. I don't think Spider Man can get away with that. Certainly, Captain America, if he's in his full suit, or Iron Man, or Superman, couldn't do that. But Spy- but Daredevil, he's just like this uh, local guy. It reminds me of when um, mm-hmm. Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie lived in New Orleans, and they said, you know, the reason we live here is because we can just sit out on. Our, like our front steps and our neighbors just wave at us and keep going. It's like nobody treats us like any differently uh, for living here. Hmm. I like the description for, uh, from the, the, from Jay edited and it was like, was it Daredevil is micromanaging the hell out of a four square block radius? Um, and I, I appreciate how rooted in the specifics of the neighborhood it is, even though the neighborhood as portrayed is like pretty invented. I mean, the, the the facades of the buildings, however, are like legit, and the the church is like actually you know is also like very legitimately depicted as well. But um, but like it, it's uh, you know, like there, there's reasons why the comics have to have Hell's Kitchen and always be a site of like just violence and crisis. Um. Whereas in reality, like people are trying to not get, not to get, or trying to like not get gentrified out of their homes. Yeah. Like that's, that's the current Hell's Kitchen struggle for people. But it was, it was um, cool that the TV show made that um, a part, made that like the main mm-hmm. plot. Yeah. Yeah. That was a really good way to tackle it rather than just acting like every place in New York is unsafe to walk. Yes. It's like, no, people are getting displaced actually. I'm like, Thank yeah, you. yeah. And it's, Coming from up top, where you know, King yeah. Will, Kingpin played wonderfully by Vincent uh, D'Onofrio, um, who um, you know, I think I, that was the strongest thing about the show. Obviously, I think everybody loves uh, King Print from that. A very mm-hmm. different Kingpin, uh, to be sure, but a very you know interesting character, and the, the way they were able to tie the main conflict to all that without just doing the oh, I'm going patrolling for crime thing that, you know, most TV, uh, most superhero stories kind of rely on. The level of sort of like hard boiledness of the 89 Daredevil uh, run is really something that I think folks who haven't read it might overlook. Um, But I want to call attention to a letter to the editor that was sent um, during one of those issues. And it is from uh, Name Withheld, because he makes an ass out of himself. Uh, people, who'd have thunk it that a lady who came into comic writing without a long history of comic fanaticism would be such a wonderfully adept comic book writer? Keep up the quality. Which is just like, eight, in 89, they're saying the same shit that they fucking say now, the douches. Uh, the, and then the person editing the letters column replies, hey, we'd have thunk it. Marvel being the house of ideas, we recognized Anne's talent almost immediately around about the 14th time she pointed it out to us. Right between her fabulous inventory stories, during her days as an assistant editor, her scripting of the long shot limited series at the time, she buried a typewriter in a raucous Ralph Macchio's skull, like we said, almost immediately. And I just always pay attention to what those letters, I, I think letters pages are kind of like where intelligence goes to die, but I always yes. just... Right, like what they always print the dumbest people, but <laughs> well, but it's I, always interesting to see. What if they're smart printing the smartest that. people that write in? Well, I, see, these days I think they deliberately choose the dumbest people to as a way to justify not having to engage with like serious fan analysis and critique. Um, but that might have been true in the past. <laughs> but yeah, I basically like I, whenever I have anything that's like um, by a woman or like from women re- regarding women in comics and a letters, I'm always keep track of like what was said, but that one just, I saw a screenshot of it. I'll post it. It was like, Oh man, boys, boys, boys. Mm. So, you know, I know that Scott, you were saying like you were, th- you had some thoughts particularly about the differences between the Nocenti Daredevil and, uh, Frank Miller's very famous run. Well, yeah. And also I, uh, doing, doing some, research for this episode, I listened to a recent um, podcast of Zdarsky interviewing Anne Nocenti and her saying that when she was editor, she made sure that there were, that they made sure to print all the really bad letters 
that they wanted to make sure that it wasn't just fan service and that it wasn't just good letters, that she also wanted people to be able hmm. to say the the dumb stuff and let them prove to themselves that prove themselves to be dumb and not, you know, people, you know, I allow people to show their face and then they can show that they're assholes. And I've, yeah, hmm. it's kind of like Twitter. Of course, if you make a post and you get a hundred replies, what's the one you're going to respond to? The meanest, nastiest, dumbest one. <laughs> um, it, it is the one that, it, and your response to it will be the one that will make you look the best. You see it all the time where somebody will say something controversial and then a bunch of people will push back on them in a very you know intelligent and fair way, but they'll highlight the one or two bad season. Like, see, this just proves I'm right. Yeah. Right. And that's just a straw argument anyway. Or you just like allow people to to ether themselves like uh when um you know Slavo Zizek just let Jordan Peterson make an ass out of himself <laughs> by talking and then he didn't he just added little seasoning to be like you're done. And then we haven't really heard much of him since. And as far as like the the Frank Miller, you know, everyone talks about the Frank Miller Daredevil run. They're like this is the best Daredevil there ever was. And that probably means that they haven't read any of the early aughts Daredevil or the early 10s Daredevil. There's so many Daredevil runs that are excellent. But if you're looking for the 80s Daredevil, you want that psychedelic bombast, that cyberpunk psychedelic feel, the, the grittiness. I think this run is definitely way more interesting than no Senti uh, Ramita run. And I, I truly believe mm -hmm. it, it gives its run for the money. Especially because I, as I got older, I like Frank Miller less. I really feel like Anno Senti has a deeper insight and understanding in the ways in which men are shitty that Frank Miller just can't quite like do in the same way. And so her, 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 her Matt Murdock is just like such a believable. Chat. Like shitty dude, and like, and as a result, the comic is just a lot more like emotionally connecting. I think, for like, I it feels like yeah, no, that is a real person, and he's shitty in real person ways. Uh, and I think that um, the dialogue is really, really great. It really, really works. She has got a great ear for it, and all of the this this particular series of it as well is full of really excellent background chatter. The yes. background dialogue happening between characters and this a little back and forth and the, the man on the street. There's so many great bits of dialogue from the man on the street or like the two kids. There's a cup, you know, he basically has his little his little kids street gang that he like, tries to be a good mentor to. And um, they're like talking, they're arguing over whether or not it's too hot in New York because of greenhouse gas or if it's too hot in New York because of the ozone layer, you know, and I'm like, I love it. She just has this richness in this that. I think is really excellent. I mean, I just think that she does the best Daredevil. And there's so many words. I love how many words there are. Like there's thought bubbles and talk bubbles. She really uses all the words. And it that really gives you sort of a feel of the maximalist approach that, that the 80s were. It's like everything. 80s, maximalist, everything in the, the, the OG run. And it, it works for me on so many levels. Yeah, I reading this, it just made me think like, wow, Anne Nocenti is a hell of a writer. I wish I, I had, you know, read more of her stuff. I, I like I would kill it for her to have like a run on Hellblazer in the 90s. I think that would have been really, you know, cool. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at her Wikipedia page now. I, I think I might check out, you know, her con Katana series from 2013. It only ran for uh, 10 issues, but it, it might have been uh cool but yeah i would i wish i mean she seems like incredibly 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 underrated as a writer if uh judging from this i i really think like there's so few women who've been given the keys to write male characters it's a big problem and it's just great that like she's i just the fact that she even got to do what she got to do was really remarkable and um, people should really be talking about her as like one of the real key voices from that that era 
and setting those directions and like they should be putting her name in the thank yous in yeah. the credits of the shows etc cetera, etc cetera, and not just be such basic bitches who only mention the same white men's names as inspirations and i'm hearing good things about her book the seeds from from a friend of mine that's coming out later this year cuz i texted a friend of mine who i went to junior high school with in at in hell's kitchen that I was like, yo, I'm talking about Anne Nocenti like today, and she reminds me of you. And she was like, oh yeah, I know her. I just interviewed her. She's cool as hell. Check out. Like, I thought that was interesting because New York City's small, and even though it's big, I think of myself as a townie, even though it's a very, very big city. So she's still making work, and apparently it's very good. I need to check it out. And she had a series at Dark Horse that was like a noir mystery. I want to take a look at that also. Is that Ruby Falls? That is correct. Yeah, I'm hearing good things about Ruby Falls. It's on my pull list, digital pull list. I haven't been to a comic book store in a while, but I want to. I miss them. If folks do want to hear about what it's like going to a comic book store now during COVID, uh, I just did an episode that you have up with interviewing John Arminio, who is also friend of the show of Zebras in America, talking I was, about his experience working at a comic book shop right I was, now. I was wondering whether I should shout him out now or not. I was like, should I shout out John right now? So I'm glad you did. John Arminio, what a sweetheart. He knows his stuff. We've had really good talks about um, how to be a comic book fan and not be a shithead, and which apparently is harder than you'd think, but that is what it is. <laughs> and you know, I recently, I recently mm. uh, had to unfortunately do a eulogy for a close friend and i talked about long shot and forge and 80s x-men because it made sense in the context and i feel like that's something i wouldn't necessarily talk about on a movie podcast but it makes sense in a comic book podcast so oh thank you for that yeah so what up john hi doug I feel like, uh, you know, if there's if there's stuff that you guys haven't hit on that you would like to let let's uh, let's do that and then we'll wrap. Uh, no, I think as a uh, everything. I uh, as I, well. One more thing is I noticed that this comic, uh, the climax of the Inferno storyline, came out in like 1989. Because I was thinking when I saw the doctor, the demon doctor, that they had pulled that from Hellraiser 2 because there's another demon doctor oh. with like appendages coming out. But I actually think the comic came out a little bit before the film. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it is really an interesting look how they've designed the like with the sort of insectoid monstrous like limbs coming out of it. And... Doc mm. Doc looks uh, scary. Yes, indeed. Yeah, my, my only thing is, like, I like that, that they tried to touch on mental health issues and dissociation, even if they didn't do it that thoughtfully. You know, they tried. And you got to start somewhere. <laughs> um, I mean, and certainly, like, you know, Typhoid Mary and the way her, yeah, DID is presented is not how actual people work no. but is a great a great really really great character really interesting villain um who i'm sure we'll be like getting more of again and and um and really is an anosenti you know jrjr creation as much as she showed up in lots of other places too oh yeah she's a this great this is where character. it began i love uh typhoid yeah i think the first place i saw her was in like Deadpool stuff that I read probably before I picked up old Daredevils. She was a love interest that makes for him, sense, yeah. which makes a lot of sense. Exactly, that makes sense. All, it ma I guess it makes me, all the sense. I just it makes sort of all the of, sense, yeah. So I guess one of the things that is just specific to the experience of like reading these Daredevil series during a time where a lot of people are describing New York as like going to hell and where the actual circumstances of being here are feel very different then I think a lot of the, the conversation is it's just a, it's just sort of shows like this just real uncanniness. And I 
I wanted to post these different panels from um, the comic of like people complaining about different New York things. And I just didn't want to because then I don't want other people who don't live here and who aren't experiencing that using that to be like, see New York's bad, see New York's hell. Oh, everyone's leaving New York. Everyone should leave New York. Like none of that is real. Um, so I ended up feeling like I couldn't just post it because I didn't want it. To. It's like, you're only allowed to criticize things when you're the one who loves them. And the people who don't love them, they got to just keep their mouths shut and go away. Um, you know, and uh, the, so the, if the, 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 the relationship that, um, you know, Marvel has always been very rooted in DC. In, sorry, Marvel has always been very rooted in New York City and the Daredevil in, in particular. And so sort of looking at the lens of people's experience of like, you know, some of the tougher times in New York City um, and sort of seeing like if people are trying, when people try to bring that storyline back, like how does that actually work or, or not? you know, in a 2020 environment is complicated. But I also think like if this comic was, if, if the new Inferno was being written, like while COVID was happening, I think you would have a very different, a very different dynamic where you have people here realizing and experiencing a crisis and yeah. other parts of the country acting like nothing was happening but like nothing was on fire. The death is not a fire-based death, okay? No. Um, it might be hell for some people, but it's not burning. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and, and, and that, like, you know, ultimately, like, people have obligation to take care of each other. And that, like, one of the reasons why, like, the city functions at all is that, like, people actually do know other people and, like have community. Um, and so I was glad to see that piece with like the neighborhood daredevils cropping in, in the, uh, the new Inferno series, for example. And, um, and through the very enlivened uh, group cast in 89 daredevil. So uh, yeah, I hope folks give the Nocenti JRJR daredevil run a read if nothing else, you'll get to see Daredevil get into a fist fight at a peace protest and check out the current series, too. So uh, tell our listeners where they can find your work on the Internet, Scott. Where should they find your podcast and check out what you're doing? Zebras in America podcast is on every podcast platform. You can find me on Twitter, Scott Thorough, Instagram, Scott Thorough. Um, if you want to listen to my music, scottthorough.com. Uh, zebras in America. You you know if you want to email us zebraspod at gmail dot com and my my podcast partner pinlandempire dot com for the best side by side cinema in the world. Yeah, Marcus's Twitter is like Pinland Empire, and everyone should follow his Twitter. And he does amazing like, and Marcus will be on the show at some point, I'm sure. But like amazing compass co co like images from different movies next to each other to see the visual relationships between them. Yeah. It's very enlightening. I have social anxiety, Leslie, so don't even follow me on Twitter. Follow Zebras on Twitter. Follow Pinlin okay. on, on Twitter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Fair enough. And Leslie, where should our folks be following yeah, your work? Yeah, just check us out. Pa uh, struggle Session. Patreon.com slash Struggle Session. Um, we talk about politics and pop culture and where they intersect. I love it. Well, thank you guys for joining me. And as always, this is Graphic Policy Radio. I'm on Twitter a little bit too much at E-L-A-N-A -A underscore Brooklyn. That's Ilana underscore Brooklyn. And if you're looking for meaningful ways to make the world we're dealing with be less of a hellscape, I'm always very happy to help people connect with meaningful volunteer opportunities for fighting the power. Um, and on that note, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link 
on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.